So this is our second episode of Two Holistic Psychiatrists Talking. And in our first episode, uh, we invited people to ask us if there was anything that they were interested in hearing about, hearing us talk about. And my old friend from college wrote a very interesting email to me after he listened to our first episode and mentioned things that were on his mind that he thought could be interesting topics of discussion. So I want to read the email that he wrote. He said, hi, Jude. I enjoyed your first episode this morning. Very enjoyable. Good for you guys doing something so productive and love the name which seems to riff on two comedians in cars getting coffee. And I thought that was particularly a compliment because Peter is in advertising. So he knows if it's a good um, title. As other topics, there are some thoughts that I have wrestled with lately, maybe of interest to you and Courtney. Different levels of isolation, isolating with family versus isolating alone. Some of our elderly neighbors seem so alone now. Feeling safe, being 20 versus being over 60 right now. Being older now, you can sometimes feel at the mercy of people who are less responsible to mutual safety. Meanwhile, younger kids are adjusting again to living with parents or if living apart with friends, having to monitor roommate behavior. Focus and priorities. Are there differences for men and women during this time? So many women seem to be very affected by concerns for safety, security, and those they care about, while men seem to be frequently discussing the economic plight that they're in. Managing not just your own fear, but those around you. Best, Peter. I thought that was just a really interesting email and he raised so many things. Right. Um, I was just saying after our last discussion, which was really, you know, about self-care, he's bringing up, you know, this issue of yes and um, our relationships with people or, you know, be it isolation or togetherness or conflict. Right. Um, right. All that comes up in relation to other beings. <laughs> other beings. And I've just been so fascinated myself by the issues that are raised that are so specific to this like totally unique situation that nobody has ever been in before. Right. And you know, it, just that, one of the things that, you know, the expression like we were made for this. Yeah. Um, and that, that's sort of a kind of a spiritual take on things. Not that it requires a belief in a higher being, but but the reality that this is the time we were born into, you know, and this is what we have. <laughs> this is what we have. I heard this uh, German spiritual teacher yesterday saying, we're all thrown into the river now and we have to swim. Right, right. So it's not a choice. Not a choice. And um, certainly, you know, the whole spectrum of, of the experience of it for people, like we talked about last time, you know, that it's different for the hospital workers. It's different for the people that are having to go to work and be with other people if they feel fearful. Um, you know, people living in poverty, or maybe there's one room that multiple people have to share. So everybody is having their unique experience of it, and not only because of their profession and because of their socioeconomic status, but also because of their character and right. their level of anxiety. Like one thing that has been really fascinating for me to observe has been, well, I mean, not just my patients, but my children. Like I have two that are very extroverted and one who is introverted. And the experience of having to stay at home is very different for each of them. The introvert, it's much less hard on him than the extroverted ones. Right, right, right. And, and I guess it could be too, if the introvert is having more time alone, that's great. But then for the introvert that is, let's say a 
a young adult or any introvert that then with family members more during this time, you know, and that's the, the complicatedness of togetherness at this time for some people. Right. So like you said, it's so many different um, extremes for people right now. Right. No, that's a good point. I mean, the introvert gets to be at home more, but is not necessarily living alone and is having to be more simple. Right, and then the, the extrovert, it could be a great thing if now they get to spend all their time with everyone being together, or they're alone and really struggling with the loss of where they get their energy from other people. Right, or they love to go to cafes and they love to go to parties and they love to get together with friends and that's just like not possible. Right. I mean, some people get really depressed with that kind of deprivation. Right, and even the, you know, like how we think of introversion and extroversion, it's where people get their fuel. Right. So if you're not... If you're not getting, if you're an extrovert and you're not getting that fuel, um, you know, and there again, it calls for creatively figuring out ways to get that fuel or to start to sort of get to know this other part of yourself. I don't think any of us are ultimately one or the other. Right, right, absolutely. That's, that's really true. There's a, there's a funny um, meme that I'll share. Maybe we can share it on um, the Facebook page, but I'll read it to you. It says, it's, it's just words. And it says, introverts, please put your book down and check your ex on your extrovert friends. They are not okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, kind of raising the awareness, like for everybody to be mindful of this is, you know, everyone's having a different experience right now. Right. You know, like my youngest is home from college and is staying here and he's an extreme introvert. And I've been so happy to have dinner with him every night, but that's not really what he wants. You know, like he wants oh, to some nights right. to not do that. So you need to respect what everybody's needs are in this whole thing. Right. So it's, gosh, it's, it's putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Um, but then also it can be having to speak up and express needs and. Right. And finding that balance between, well, you know, like it would, it does make sense for him to sometimes have dinner with me and he wants to, but you know, like you have to figure out that balance between asking for what you need and respecting what the other person's needs and wishes are. That's, I mean, that's right. That's a fact of life, but exaggerated at this time, as is like almost everything it seems. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's comes up with the, the togetherness, you know, thinking about teens and young adults who just developmentally, you know, this would be, there's, you know, spreading their wings at this time in their life, and now their um, their futures are on hold, and they're dependent on their parents more. Right. I've been thinking a lot about kids who are graduating both from high school and from college now. Right. Um, like, it's challenging to try to find a job in this environment. And it's challenging to figure out about going to college. Like I heard a program on the radio yesterday about, well, first of all, people's finances are very different. Parents' finances are very different. And they maybe can't afford to send their kid to a college that's not a public college and local. And let alone, you know, flying across the country to a different school. Um, it just raises just, and I mean, who knows? And, and education is going to have to change and has changed with so many things being online. Um, but it's just very unique situations to 
the virus. Right, right. And, you know, it, and, and it's not as if we just hold our breath and get through it. I mean, as you're pointing out, like life is changing before us, like the way we don't know even what all this online education is going to turn into, you know, or online people working from home. It's right. gonna, the more people do it, the more it's going to alter how things go in the future, but also the unknown of what's going to happen with the virus and the testing. Right. The whole issue of having no timeline mm -hmm. and just needing to kind of surrender and accept that this is what is now at the moment and having trust that you'll stay in the present moment and just continue to navigate. Right. And I, you know, I think about this age group that we've been talking about, like young adults and even older teens and how, you know, how in this situation, let's say they're, they're living at home with their parents, how can they still sort of have that developmentally appropriate, um, you know, from a real practical sense, is it, is it for them to kind of be given permission to say, I'm going to go to my room and I need time alone, if they can go to a room, you know, or I'm going to go take a walk. Um, I need time alone. I love you. It's not that I don't want to be with you, but for me to be more, you know, pleasant to be around or however, I need to have, um, some time to myself and time connecting with my friends on Zoom or whatever. Um, right, those are all like good suggestions about how you could give a kid space in this kind of constricted condition. Right, almost like, like as hard as it can be better sort of heart-to-heart -heart conversations, you know, where the pride is put away, I yeah. think. Right, um, right, and... And then for the parents, I'm imagining having the children home and needing them to help, like, participate in responsibilities, and, you know, that might be a challenge for some families. Is Are they just coming to stay at a hotel for a while, or are they, you know, Chipping in with all the... Right, there's so many complexities. And one of my, this is a little bit different, but one of my kids lives with two roommates. And no. mm -hmm. his roommates are not as careful as he about social distancing. And he has felt kind of mad at one of them for like bringing people over. And then he feels like he can't say anything because his girlfriend is a nurse and she comes over. So it just yeah. creates all of these very unusual dynamics. The whole thing about cautiousness and level of cautiousness and right. that people are different that way. And, you know, like there's situations of like divorce where there's shared custody and pre the virus, there's high conflict between the parents. And one of the parents in the other parent's mind is being very irresponsible about being safe. And then the kids are going back and forth. It's, it's not that I have a solution to this, but just raising these remarkable dilemmas that are so unique to this situation that you would have never thought of before. Right. Right, and I think even just talking about it raises, you know, an understanding or an even awareness that, that people might have of, yes, these are, <laughs> you know, to be heard. I think there's so many scenarios. But, I mean, the ones that you talk about with this situation and the roommates, to me, like the anger that can come up really speaks to the how vulnerable we are to each other right now. Like... You know, like if one parent is vulnerable to the choices, like their life potentially, or they're being sick, or their children being cared for, they're vulnerable to the other. Um, or if a roommate is vulnerable to whatever 
that other roommate is bringing home. Right. Um, it's, you know, recognizing it as vulnerability. Sometimes I think that even that leads into a better way of being able to communicate with whoever that person is. I mean, you know, high conflict divorce situations, it doesn't get harder than, than that. Right. You know, because having those heart to heart in terms of I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling vulnerable. I'm afraid. I mean, I guess an example we could talk about would be a marriage where it's a marriage where the parents are disagreeing. One parent thinks this is all a joke and they're more concerned about the economy, you know, potentially like you, your friend raised the dynamic between men and women. Yeah. And so, and then maybe the wife is worried about the health and, and safety of the family members. And then how do they navigate that? Right. And they both feel vulnerable to each other's positions. Right. And I mean, there's not any kind of fix for it besides empathy. Right. And that's what I think all, I think, so much of this sort of leads to like like to navigate it would seem to be having to try to imagine what it's like to have the other person's perspective not unlike what we deal with with political differences in the world you know it's really hard to to do that but i think that's what it requires to to not have that anger and then to find like I guess they even talk about that with conflict resolution, you know, where if you can really put yourself in the other person's situation, then you start to humanize the other and you start right. to uh, listen and better. Kind of demonize. Yeah. And then it's finding a common ground. Cause I think there are creative solutions that, that somehow get figured out when people come to that heart space and not that, you know, that butting heads. Right, and, and to recognize that sometimes, or really frequently, that our defensiveness or ways that we're entrenched has to do with fear. Right, just recognizing it, yeah. Yeah right in ourselves and in the other. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've been thinking his questions, I think one was the aloneness we haven't talked so much about. I mean, I guess more we've talked, I guess, of togetherness and the conflicts that can arise there. Right, but I mean, that is really serious. I mean, a lot of people live alone these days. It's kind of a phenomena that, at least in this country, that people are wealthy enough to afford to be able to live alone. But the, the way that they make that work is by getting together with friends and um, being parts of different groups and communities. And then all of a sudden they're just at home. And that is difficult. I mean, that causes a very high level of stress for many people to just have no contact with another human being. I mean, you can have the virtual contact, but no in-person contact. That's difficult. Right. And I think even more so for people that are feeling vulnerable, you know, in terms of their safety. And there's a whole spectrum there. Some people aren't concerned and some people are... And elderly people who can't really navigate the technology as right. with as much facility. You know, that's, I mean, it's very touching. <laughs> the yoga teacher this morning was talking about dropping food off for his mom and like standing on the, at the street and she's at the door and he's like waving to her. Oh, mm-hmm. Yeah. That's my mother-in-law is, um, it's not a nursing home, but it's a, you know, it's a retirement community that has, they have shared 
the dining room, but otherwise they have their own rooms and and they've it's been I want to say four weeks now that they can't have any visitors and they also can't dine together. Um, so it's and she's 100. Oh, wow. <laughs> and um, they've actually been really good about setting up or allowing family members to set up, um, you know, Zoom meetings. And then they help set it up and facilitate, you know, be there to yeah. make sure it's a go. And then they come back when we're done. But I mean, some of the most heartbreaking things I've heard have been about like people who go to the hospital and then their loved ones can't be there with them and people are, you know, in the hospital alone. It's, there is a lot of suffering right now, you know, that um, there's degrees of it. There's degrees of it, but. Right, where it helps sort of put it all in perspective. Um, I think for the, it seems like the doctors and nurses and medical staff, they sort of have another calling at this time, you know, to be that comforting presence. There was a, this was one of the sort of divine sightings as far as I was concerned. Um, it was the, it was a picture of three medical staff in their full um, protective PPE, you know, equipment. And they had laminated photos of themselves because, you know, their faces. Oh, man. So they had laminated photos of themselves with big smiles on their face so that the patients that are just looking at their eyes and can't see their expression could, you know, see who was caring for them. And um, that is really profound. Yeah, I thought it, that was really beautiful. Yeah, I mean, there's something so weird about like being around other people who are in masks. I mean, even like on the street, you know, like you just sort of see these eyes and, you know, you can't see people's faces. Like I actually went for a walk with a friend, um, keeping social distance and like, it was hard to hear her through the mask and I couldn't see her face. And the whole thing was very unsatisfying. Like I actually even preferred to be on Zoom and to be able to see somebody's face when I'm talking to them. Right. I think it's really a primitive, you know, I, it caught my attention when I saw mothers that had just had babies having to wear masks. Oh and, my gosh. And it made me just think about, you know, what we know about imprinting from just facial features. Right. And, um, and so my hope is that they're, you know, the hospitals are aware of that and they're doing things to, you know, get around that. But I think it speaks to how primitive our need is to see faces. Right. And that's just one of these fascinating, like totally unique to this situation, situation that is arising, you know. So I'm trying to think of other things he yeah. brought up. Oh, yeah, I mean, he raised like what it's like for people of, of different ages, you know, like, and we were talking about like levels of cautiousness. Um, like at one point, I didn't have any eggs at home. And so I decided to go to the store, being careful and get eggs. And my son who's here was so mad at me for going to the store, like, what are you thinking, mom, you know? And it was just so interesting to be scolded by your child. You know, like there's also like this role reversal in a certain kind of way. I mean, I'm not old enough to yet be in need of care for my children previously. But now, you know, like they don't want me to go to the store. Right, right, and that's another, um, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, to have somebody watching out for you at any time is, is lovely, but I do. Yes no. <laughs> yeah, but I, mean, I can't help but wonder, um, you know, 
there's a lot of things that come up in terms of the experience of this for different ages. Yeah. So, um, like people in the age group where everyone's saying, don't go anywhere, you know, what is, what is that like? Or, or even when people are saying like with the economy, um, oh, we should be choosing the American way of living <laughs> over, um, you know, protecting, you know, demographic a certain age range. And I just, as I hear these different things in the news, I, um, I keep trying to sort of imagine, like, what is that? How does that land for people, you know, in different, um, I mean, I'm 52, so I'm like in between, I'm, I'm like in between and having had some health issues, you know, I could see where I could potentially fall in that vulnerable category. Um, but I don't get that message all the time of, you know, that, um, so it's a, well, I feel like prematurely being, you know, through this whole situation of being like an at risk group because of being in my 60s that like I'm prematurely being made kind of old and you know need to be protected and I can't do stuff and um, I mean it's like the problems of the first world because you know how lucky am I to have other people to help me do stuff but still it is bothersome right or, or people that have chronic health issues, you know, and every time I hear someone say, you know, when they're going through these counts or these deaths, oh, and they had, you know, all these people had chronic health issues. <laughs> it's like, you know, like, how does, how does that land to somebody that has chronic health issues and it's maybe in their 80s that, um, I'm just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the kind of thing where, as we said, there's so many experiences here and as much as we can as you use the word empathy but have empathy for like how this is landing on everyone differently right right and there was i mean i haven't heard now about as much anxiety about there not being like enough ventilators but you know a few weeks ago there was conversation about triage and who gets the ventilators and what if you have a child who's developmentally disabled and, you know, that's not deemed, you know, a good candidate versus somebody else, you know, like it's very difficult. And also these people who are in like these developmentally disabled adults who are in homes, like uh, not homes, but um, institutions and that their families can't visit them and that there's no way of explaining to the child because of, or the adult child because of their cognitive abilities about why they're not having a visitor. Right. Right. And then people in prisons who, you know, are vulnerable because of the close proximity to other prisoners and then not being able to have contact with their families. It's right. Um, so it's a very, very difficult challenges raised by this whole thing. And I know, you know, as you said, they're not, we're obviously don't have a fix for all these challenges and answers, but I think as you said, empathy is, like if if everyone could sort of fall back on that, fall it would on be empathy a and remember that you're not alone. Like I'm hoping that some of these things that we're talking about, that people who are listening will say, "Yeah, I thought of that too. That's how I feel too." So that you know, just you know that these are shared experiences, and as much as possible to do what you can to not allow fear to get the best of you you know like to stay grounded in your body to stay grounded in the present moment to stay with your breath if you feel yourself um feeling scared because it is like such an uncertain crazy weird time right and, and to express those fears that you 
fingers to someone that you trust and absolutely right relationally to reach out you know to connect with people because that is also like extremely calming to the nervous system even if you can't really fix it for them to just be present listening is like a huge um offering right and the fixing gets in the way of that, I think. Yeah. You know, we, we sort of always feel like we need to fix and give advice, but it's it, usually what people are needing is to be heard and seen. Yeah. You know, Courtney, before um, we started this call, I was listening to the radio to, it was the BBC News Hour, and it was this report about this seven-year-old boy in Greece named Stelios Caridis or something like that. I don't think I have it exactly right. And he is a prodigy, a piano prodigy. Both of his parents are piano teachers. And I think a year ago he started composing music. And I don't know if it was the first piece he composed, but he composed a piece for his sisters. And he just composed a piece that is for people who are in isolation and who are suffering because of this virus. And it's called something like the Isolation Waltz. And it's so gorgeous. It's like two minutes long. And we'll link to it. Um, Oh, good. I'll listen to it after. after it's this. so beautiful. And I wanted um, to share it with you and with um, the listeners because it's very kind of sad, but beautiful and also uplifting. And then just the miracle that this seven year old child plays the piano this way and composed this beautiful mm -hmm. piece of music. And that's the kind of thing that I think gets people to their sort of that space of like their higher self and. Absolutely. And a collective, you know, we're all one in this, that it's music and moments, you know. Yeah. And I felt like somehow the fact that I like heard that just right before um, okay. we were supposed to. It's a divine to... sighting. <laughs> yeah, it was a divine <laughs> sighting, like totally. Yeah. And those divine sightings really keep you going. Right, right. Well, good. We'll link it and then um, I'm going to listen to it now. Yeah, all right. Well, great to see you. Great to see you. Bye All you. right. Look forward to the next time.